Chapter 1 of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, The Illuminating Diary of a Professional Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jen Broda. Gentlemen Prefer Blondes by Anita Luz. Chapter 1 Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. March 16th. A gentleman friend and I were dining at the Ritz last evening, and he said that if I took a pencil and a paper and put down all of my thoughts, it would make a book. This almost made me smile, as what it would really make would be a whole row of encyclopedias. I mean, I seem to be thinking practically all of the time. I mean, it is my favorite recreation— and sometimes I sit for hours and do not seem to do anything else but think. So this gentleman said a girl with brains ought to do something else with them besides think. And he said he ought to know brains when he sees them, because he is in the Senate, and he spends quite a great deal of time in Washington, D.C., and when he comes into contact with brains, he always notices it. So it might have all blown over. But this morning he sent me a book. And so, when my maid brought it to me, I said to her, Well, Lulu, here is another book, and we have not read half the ones we have got yet. But when I opened it and saw that it was all a blank, I remembered what my gentleman acquaintance said, and so then I realized that it was a diary. So here I am, writing a book instead of reading one. But now it is the 16th of March, and of course it is too late to begin with January, but it does not matter, as my gentleman friend, Mr. Eisman, was in town practically all of January and February, and when he is in town, one day seems to be practically the same as the next day. I mean, Mr. Eisman is in the wholesale button profession in Chicago, and he is the gentleman who is known practically all over Chicago as Gus Eisman, the button king, and he is the gentleman who is interested in educating me. So, of course, he is always coming down to New York to see how my brains have improved since the last time. But when Mr. Eisman is in New York, we always seem to do the same thing— and if I wrote down one day in my diary, all I would have to do would be to put quotation marks for all the other days. I mean, we always seem to have dinner at the Colony, and see a show, and go to the Trocadero, and then Mr. Eisman shows me to my apartment. So, of course, when a gentleman is interested in educating a girl, he likes to stay and talk about the topics of the day until quite late, so I am quite fatigued the next day and I do not really get up until it is time to dress for dinner at the colony. It would be strange if I turn out to be an authoress. I mean, at my home near Little Rock, Arkansas, my family all wanted me to do something about my music, because all my friends said I had talent, and they all kept after me and kept after me about practicing. But some way, I never seemed to care so much about practicing. I mean, I simply could not sit for hours and hours at a time practicing just for the sake of a career. So one day I got quite temperamental and threw the old mandolin clear across the room, and I have really never touched it since. But writing is different, because you do not have to learn or practice, and it is more temperamental, because practicing seems to take all the temperament out of me. So now I really almost have to smile, because I have just noticed that I have written clear across two pages on to March 18th, so this will do for today and tomorrow. And it just shows how temperamental I am when I get started. March 19th Well, last evening Dorothy called up, and Dorothy said she has met a gentleman who gave himself an introduction to her in the lobby of the Ritz. So then they went to luncheon, and tea, and dinner, and then they went to a show, and then they went to the Trocadero. So Dorothy said his name was Lord Cooksley, but what she really calls him is Cuckoo. So Dorothy said, 
Why don't you and I and Cuckoo go to the Follies tonight and bring Gus along if he is in town? So then Dorothy and I had quite a little quarrel, because every time that Dorothy mentions the subject of Mr. Eisman, she calls Mr. Eisman by his first name, and she does not seem to realize that when a gentleman who is as important as Mr. Eisman spends quite a lot of money educating a girl, it really does not show reverence to call a gentleman by his first name. I mean, I never even think of calling Mr. Eisman by his first name, but if I want to call him anything at all, I call him Daddy, and I do not even call him Daddy if a place seems to be public. So I told Dorothy that Mr. Eisman would not be in town until day after tomorrow. So then Dorothy and Cuckoo came up, and we went to the Follies. So this morning, Cuckoo called up, and he wanted me to lunch in at the Ritz. I mean, these foreigners really have quite a nerve. Just because Cuckoo is an Englishman and a lord, he thinks a girl can waste hours on him just for a luncheon at the Ritz, when all he does is talk about some exposition he went on to a place called Tibet, and after talking for hours, I found out that all they were was a lot of Chinamen. So I will be quite glad to see Mr. Eisman when he gets in, because he always has something quite interesting to talk about. As for instance, the last time he was here, he presented me with quite a beautiful emerald bracelet. So next week is my birthday, and he always has some delightful surprise on holidays. I did intend to luncheon at the Ritz with Dorothy today, and of course Cuckoo had to spoil it, as I told him that I could not luncheon with him today because my brother was in town on business and had the mumps, so I really could not leave him alone. Because, of course, if I went to the Ritz now, I would bump into Cuckoo. But I sometimes almost have to smile at my own imagination, because, of course, I have not got any brother— and I have not even thought of the mumps for years. I mean, it is no wonder that I can write. So the reason I thought I would take luncheon at the Ritz was because Mr. Chaplin is at the Ritz, and I always like to renew old acquaintances, because I met Mr. Chaplin once when we were both working on the same lot in Hollywood, and I am sure he would remember me. Gentlemen always seem to remember blondes. I mean, the only career I would like to be besides an authoress is a cinema star, and I was doing quite well in the cinema when Mr. Eisman made me give it all up. Because, of course, when a gentleman takes a friendly interest in educating a girl, as Mr. Eisman does, you like to show that you appreciate it, and he is against a girl being in the cinema because his mother is orthodox. March 20th Mr. Eisman gets in tomorrow to be here in time for my birthday, so I thought it would really be delightful to have at least one good time before Mr. Eisman got in, so last evening I had some literary gentlemen in to spend the evening because Mr. Eisman always likes me to have literary people in and out of the apartment. I mean, he is quite anxious for a girl to improve her mind, and his greatest interest in me is because I always seem to want to improve my mind and not waste any time. And Mr. Eisman likes me to have what the French people call a salo, which means that people all get together in the evening and improve their minds. So I invited all of the brainy gentlemen I could think up. So I thought up a gentleman who is the professor of all the economics up at Columbia College, and the editor who is the famous editor of the New York Transcript, and another gentleman who is the famous playwright who writes very, very famous plays that are all about life. I mean, anybody would recognize his name, but it always seems to slip my memory, because all of we real friends of his only call him Sam. So Sam asked if he could bring a gentleman who writes novels from England. So I said yes. So he brought him. And then we all got together, and I called up Gloria and Dorothy, and the gentlemen brought their own liquor. So of course the place was a wreck this morning, and Lulu and I worked like proverbial dogs to get it cleaned up. But heaven knows how long it will take to get the chandelier fixed. 
March 22nd. Well, my birthday has come and gone, but it was really quite depressing. I mean, it seems to me a gentleman who has a friendly interest in educating a girl like Gus Eisman would want her to have the biggest square-cut diamond in New York. I mean, I must say, I was quite disappointed when he came to the apartment with a little thing you could hardly see. So I told him I thought it was quite cute, but I had quite a headache, and I had better stay in a dark room all day, and I told him I would see him the next day, perhaps. Because even Lulu thought it was quite small, and she said, if she was I, she really would do something definite, and she said she always believed in the old adage, leave them while you're good-looking. But he came in at dinner time with really a very, very beautiful bracelet of square-cut diamonds, so I was quite cheered up. So then we had dinner at the colony, and we went to a show and supper at the Trocadero, as usual, whenever he is in town. But I will give him credit that he realized how small it was. I mean, he kept talking about how bad business was, and the button profession was full of Bolsheviks, who made nothing but trouble. Because Mr. Eisman feels that the country is really on the verge of the Bolsheviks, and I become quite worried. I mean, if the Bolsheviks do get in, there is only one gentleman who could handle them, and that is Mr. D. W. Griffith. Because I will never forget when Mr. Griffith was directing Intolerance— I mean, it was my last cinema just before Mr. Eisman made me give up my career, and I was playing one of the girls that fainted at the battle when all of the gentlemen fell off the tower. And when I saw how Mr. Griffith handled all of those mobs in intolerance, I realized that he could do anything. And I really think that the government of America ought to tell Mr. Griffith to get all ready if the Bolsheviks start to do it. Well... I forgot to mention that the English gentleman who writes novels seems to have taken quite an interest in me as soon as he found out that I was literary. I mean, he has called up every day, and I went to tea twice with him, so he has sent me a whole complete set of books for my birthday by a gentleman called Mr. Conrad. They all seem to be about ocean travel, although I have not had time to more than glance through them. I have always liked novels about ocean travel, ever since I posed for Mr. Christie for the front cover of a novel about ocean travel by McGrath, because I always say that a girl never really looks as well as she does on board a steamship or even a yacht. So the English gentleman's name is Mr. Gerald Lamson, as those who have read his novels would know. And he also sent me some of his own novels, as they seem to be about middle-aged English gentlemen who live in the country over in London and seem to ride bicycles, which seems quite different from America, except at Palm Beach. So I told Mr. Lamson how I write down all of my thoughts, and he said he knew I had something to me from the first minute he saw me, and when we become better acquainted, I am going to let him read my diary. I mean, I even told Mr. Eisman about him, and he is quite pleased, because, of course, Mr. Lamson is quite famous, and it seems Mr. Eisman has read all of his novels going to and fro on the trains, and Mr. Eisman is always anxious to meet famous people and take them to the Ritz to dinner on Saturday night. But, of course, I did not tell Mr. Eisman that I am really getting quite a little crush on Mr. Lamson, which I really believe I am, but Mr. Eisman thinks my interest in him is more literary. March 30th. At last, Mr. Eisman has left on the 20th century, and I must say, I am quite fatigued, and a little rest will be quite welcome. I mean, I do not mind staying out late every night if I dance, but Mr. Eisman is really not such a good dancer, so most of the time we just sit and drink some champagne or have a bite to eat, and of course I do not dance with anyone else when I am out with Mr. Eisman. But Mr. Eisman and Jerry, as Mr. Lamson wants me to call him, became quite good friends, and we had several evenings, all three together. So now that Mr. Eisman is out of town at last, Jerry and I are going out together this evening, 
and Jerry said not to dress up, because Jerry seems to like me more for my soul. So I really had to tell Jerry that if all the gentlemen were like he seems to be, Madame Francis's whole dressmaking establishment would have to go out of business. But Jerry does not like a girl to be nothing else but a doll, but he likes her to bring in her husband's slippers every evening and make him forget what he has gone through. But before Mr. Eisman went to Chicago, he told me that he is going to Paris this summer on professional business, and I think he intends to present me with a trip to Paris, as he says there is nothing so educational as traveling. I mean, it did worlds of good to Dorothy when she went abroad last spring, and I never get tired of hearing her telling how the merry-go-rounds in Paris have pigs instead of horses. But I really do not know whether to be thrilled or not, because, of course, if I go to Paris, I will have to leave Jerry, and both Jerry and I have made up our minds not to be separated from one another from now on. March 31st Last night, Jerry and I had dinner at quite a quaint place where we had roast beef and baked potato. I mean, he always wants me to have food, which is what he calls nourishing, which most gentlemen never seem to think about. So then we took a handsome cab and drove for hours around the park because Jerry said the air would be good for me. It is really very sweet to have someone think of all those things that gentlemen hardly ever seem to think about. So then we talked quite a lot. I mean, Jerry knows how to draw a girl out, and I told him things that I really would not even put in my diary. So when he heard all about my life, he became quite depressed, and we both had tears in our eyes, because he said he never dreamed a girl could go through so much as I and come out so sweet and not made bitter by it all. I mean, Jerry thinks that most gentlemen are brutes, and hardly ever think about a girl's soul. So it seems that Jerry has quite a lot of trouble himself, and he cannot even get married on account of his wife. He and she have never been in love with each other, but she was a suffragette and asked him to marry her, so what could he do? So we rode all around the park until quite late, talking and philosophizing quite a lot, and I finally told him that I thought, after all, that bird life was the highest form of civilization. So Jerry calls me his little thinker, and I really would not be surprised if all of my thoughts will give him quite a few ideas for his novels, because Jerry says he has never seen a girl of my personal appearance with so many brains, and he had almost given up looking for his ideal when our paths seemed to cross each other, and I told him I really thought a thing like that was nearly always the result of fate. So Jerry says that I remind him quite a lot of Helen of Troy, who was of Greek extraction. But the only Greek I know is a Greek gentleman by the name of Mr. Georgopoulos, who is really quite wealthy and he is what Dorothy and I call a shopper, because you can always call him up at any hour and ask him to go shopping, and he is always quite delighted, which very few gentlemen seem to be. And he never seems to care how much anything costs. I mean, Mr. Georgopoulos is also quite cultured, as I know quite a few gentlemen who can speak to a waiter in French, but Mr. Georgopoulos can also speak to a waiter in Greek, which very few gentlemen seem to be able to do. April 1st. I am taking special pains with my diary from now on, as I am really writing it for Jerry. I mean, he and I are going to read it together some evening in front of the fireplace. But Jerry leaves this evening for Boston, as he has to lecture about all of his works at Boston, but he will rush right back as soon as possible. So I'm going to spend all of my time improving myself while he is gone, and this afternoon we are both going to a museum on Fifth Avenue because Jerry wants to show me a very, very beautiful cup made by an antique jeweler called Mr. Cellini and he wants me to read Mr. Cellini's Life, which is a very, very fine book and not dull while he is in Boston. 
So the famous playwright friend of mine, who is called Sam, called up this morning, and he wanted me to go to a literary party tonight that he and some other literary gentlemen are giving to Florence Mills in Harlem, but Jerry does not want me to go with Sam, as Sam always insists on telling risque stories. But personally, I am quite broad-minded, and I always say that I do not mind a risque story as long as it is really funny. I mean, I have a great sense of humor. But Jerry says Sam does not always select and choose his stories, and he just as soon as I did not go out with him. So I am going to stay home and read the book by Mr. Cellini instead. Because after all... The only thing I am really interested in is improving my mind. So I am going to do nothing else but improve my mind while Jerry is in Boston. I mean, I just received a cable from Willie Gwynn, who arrives from Europe tomorrow, but I am not even going to bother to see him. He is a sweet boy, but he never gets anywhere, and I am not going to waste my time on such as him after meeting a gentleman like Jerry. April 2nd. I seem to be quite depressed this morning, as I always am when there is nothing to put my mind to, because I decided not to read the book by Mr. Cellini. I mean, it was quite amusing in spots because it was really quite risque, but the spots were not so close together, and I never seem to like to always be hunting clear through a book for the spots I am looking for, especially when there are really not so many spots that seem to be so amusing after all. So I did not waste my time on it, but this morning I told Lulu to let all of the housework go and spend the day reading a book entitled Lord Jim and then tell me all about it so that I would improve my mind while Jerry is away. But when I got her the book, I nearly made a mistake and gave her a book by the title of the nigger of Narcissus, which really would have hurt her feelings. I mean, I do not know why authors cannot say negro instead of nigger, as they have their feelings just the same as we have. Well, I just got a telegram from Jerry that he will not be back until tomorrow, and also some orchids from Willie Gwynn, so I may as well go to the theater with Willie tonight to keep from getting depressed, as he really is a sweet boy after all. I mean, he never really does anything obnoxious, and it is quite depressing to stay at home and do nothing but read, unless you really have a book that is worth bothering about. April 3rd I was really so depressed this morning that I was even glad to get a letter from Mr. Eisman, because last night Willie Gwynn came to take me to the Follies, but he was so intoxicated that I had to telephone his club to send around a taxi to take him home. So that left me alone with Lulu at nine o'clock with nothing to do. So I put in a telephone call for Boston to talk to Jerry, but it never went through. So Lulu tried to teach me how to play mahjong, but I really could not keep my mind on it because I was so depressed. So today I think I had better go over to Madame Francis's and order some new evening gowns to cheer me up. Well, Lulu just brought me a telegram from Jerry that he will be in this afternoon, but I must not meet him at the station on account of all the reporters who always meet him at the station wherever he comes from. But he says he will come right up to see me as he has something to talk about. April 4th what an evening we had last evening. I mean, it seems that Jerry is madly in love with me. Because all of the time he was in Boston lecturing to the women's clubs, he said, as he looked over the faces of all those club women in Boston, he never realized I was so beautiful. And he said that there was only one in the world, and that was me but it seems that Jerry thinks that Mr. Eisman is terrible and that no good can come of our friendship. I mean, I was quite surprised, as they both seemed to get along quite well together. But it seems that Jerry never wants me to see Mr. Eisman again, and he wants me to give up everything and study French, and he will get a divorce and we will be married. 
because Jerry does not seem to like the kind of life all of us lead in New York, and he wants me to go home to Papa in Arkansas, and he will send me books to read so that I will not get lonesome there. And he gave me his uncle's Masonic ring, which came down from the time of Solomon and which he never even lets his wife wear, for our engagement ring. And this afternoon, a lady friend of his is going to bring me a new system she thought up of how to learn French. But some way, I still seem to be depressed. I mean, I could not sleep all night thinking of the terrible things Jerry said about New York and about Mr. Eisman. Of course, I can understand Jerry being jealous of any gentleman friend of mine. And of course, I never really thought that Mr. Eisman was Rudolph Valentino— but Jerry said it made him cringe to think of a sweet girl like I having a friendship with Mr. Eisman. So it really made me feel quite depressed. I mean, Jerry likes to talk quite a lot, and I always think a lot of talking is depressing, and worries your brains with things you never even think of when you are busy. But so long as Jerry does not mind me going out with other gentlemen when they have something to give you mentally— I am going to luncheon with Eddie Goldmark of the Goldmark Films, who is always wanting me to sign a contract to go into the cinema. Because Mr. Goldmark is madly in love with Dorothy, and Dorothy is always wanting me to go back to the cinema, because Dorothy says that she will go if I will go. April 6th Well, I finally wrote Mr. Eisman that I was going to get married— and it seems that he is coming on at once as he would probably like to give me his advice. Getting married is really quite serious, and Jerry talks to me for hours and hours about it. I mean, he never seems to get tired of talking, and he does not seem to even want to go to shows or dance or do anything else but talk. And if I don't really have something definite to put my mind on soon, I will scream. April 7th. Well, Mr. Eisman arrived this morning, and he and I had quite a long talk, and after all, I think he is right, because here is the first real opportunity I have ever really had. I mean to go to Paris and broaden out and improve my writing, and why should I give it up to marry an author where he is the whole thing, and all I would be would be the wife of Gerald Lamson. And on top of that, I would have to be dragged into the scandal of a divorce court and get my name smirched. So Mr. Eisman said that opportunities come too seldom in a girl's life for me to give up the first one I have really ever had. So I am sailing for France and London on Tuesday and taking Dorothy with me, and Mr. Eisman says that he will see us there later. So Dorothy knows all of the ropes, and she can get along in Paris just as though she knew French. And besides, she knows a French gentleman who was born and raised there, who speaks it like a native, and knows Paris like a book. And Dorothy says that when we get to London, nearly everybody speaks English anyway. So it is quite lucky that Mr. Lamson is out lecturing in Cincinnati, and he will not be back until Wednesday, and I can send him a letter and tell him that I have to go to Europe now, but I will see him later, perhaps. So anyway, I will be spared listening to any more of his depressing conversation. So Mr. Eisman gave me quite a nice string of pearls, and he gave Dorothy a diamond pin, and we all went to the colony for dinner, and we all went to a show and supper at the Trocadero, and we all spent quite a pleasant evening. End of chapter 1